but we are destroying our children's innocence at ages far, far earlier than has ever been done in American society. It's been done in other societies before, and those societies typically did not end very well. Those societies typically did not have a, a good moral foundation, and because of that, their society as a whole crumbled or greatly suffered as a result. But I'm saying in American society, in American culture, from the time of our founding in the 1700s, really up until now, in a lot of ways, maybe not every way, but in a lot of ways, our children's innocence has been completely ignored as something that is sacred and worth protecting. And there's several examples of that. The first story came out of California earlier this week. There were 700 kids in California that were pulled from the classroom in protest of a curriculum. So remember, this is California, which means that the school systems are going to be uber, uber liberal, but it also means that the parents in California, by and large, probably not all of them, but by and large are going to be further to the left than a group of parents in, say, the state of Alabama. It's just the way that things are. And so we all know and understand this. The fact that there were parents of 700 children that pulled out of this school district, which, by the way, was a significant chunk of the overall student population, should be a pretty strong indication that even in uber-left, deep, deep blue California, there's an awful lot of parents that are not on board with this kind of curriculum being taught. So what was the curriculum that was so controversial? They were upset about them teaching about prominent gay historic figures to second graders. Now, here's the thing. I have no problem with a child, even as young as second grade, learning about prominent historic figures that also happen to be gay. Great example. There is a fair amount of speculation that Alexander the Great was a gay person. It made sense in his time and his culture. That was not something that was unheard of. Maybe he was gay, maybe he was bi, we're really not sure. But there's at least some historic evidence that lends us to believe that he may have been gay. I don't think that because he's gay, automatically his name should be stricken from all of the history books and, and children should not learn about Alexander the Great because he's an important historic figure. There are notable other historic figures that are either suspected of being gay or we know for a fact were gay. Uh, the, one of the big prominent ones that comes to mind is, I believe his name's Alan Turing, and he is the man that basically invented what we know as the modern computer. He was a code hacker in World War II, did a lot of really great things, helped defeat the Nazis. He was also gay. That doesn't mean that his contributions to history are all of a sudden null and void, and he should not be studied merely because he was homosexual. But here's the thing that they are ignoring. Why is a second grader learning about any historic figure sexuality? Gay, straight, whatever. I don't understand why that should be included in the curriculum. Because, to be honest, and, and this is one thing that I'm grateful for growing up in a Christian household, I didn't know what gay was when I was in second grade and didn't care and didn't want to know. Because to me, it was the, the concept of, of men... Well, frankly, the concept of sex was pretty foreign to me when I was eight years old. But even if I had understood, you know, the, the, the inner workings of, of sexual intercourse it still would have been a foreign concept to me that a man would want to do that with another man or a woman with another woman. That, that just would have been something that wouldn't even cross my mind. And that's because sex itself was not something that really crossed my mind. But what they've done is they're trying to force this into kids before they're old enough or mature enough to really understand what that means. And when it comes to historic figures, they shouldn't be learning about any historic figure sexuality, no matter who it is. Let's take somebody that I really like as an example. If you've watched this show for any amount of time, you know how much I revere the Founding Fathers. Let's take Benjamin Franklin, one of my favorite. Benjamin Franklin, in his younger days, now he didn't really do this nearly as much. He became more spiritual and became a much moral person as he matured. But in his younger days, he was well known to frequent French brothels. It was just something that is historically true. There's no disputing it. 
And so I don't want a second grader to learn about that aspect of Benjamin Franklin's character. When they get older, maybe, that might be something to include. It is actual historic his, I mean, it's, it's actual historic information. It is a truism. But the thing is, they shouldn't be learning about that when they're eight years old. Now, you want to talk about Benjamin Franklin's contributions to the Constitution in second grade? Yeah, go for it. I, I wish that our second graders knew more about that kind of stuff. You want to talk about him flying a, a kite, talk about his philanthropy. You want to talk about his contribution to the scientific community. Any of those things. Yeah, by all means. I mean, for goodness sake, he's one of the men that was on the actual committee with John Adams to draft the original Declaration of Independence that, that of course, Thomas Jefferson put together. So I've got no problem with you talking about all of those things. I don't think it's appropriate to teach an eight-year-old about him frequenting French brothels when he was a younger man. That's not something that's insignificant or that should be completely ignored maybe later on when they're, you know, high school, college, I don't see it as something that is super significant to understanding his contributions to society, but I don't think that should be hidden either. I'm just saying, if we're going to talk about the sexuality of historic figures, let's put that off until, oh, at least the child has reached sexual maturity themselves. And so this isn't even a gay or straight thing. I don't want them learning about anybody's sexuality, no matter who it's with until a little bit later in life where they are emotionally and physically more mature and can handle that kind of information. I think that that's wholly appropriate when it comes to that. So their defense of this, and this is coming via Rachel Henry, who is the LGBT Community Center spokesman here in the school district. She said, and I quote, there are several empirical studies that show textbook curriculum that is explicitly inclusive of LGBTQ+, has dramatically positive effects on school climate for both LGBTQ+, and non-LG... Can't we just say gay and non-gay? Uh, LG... Non-LGBTQ+, students. Students of marginalized groups, such as LGBTQ+, for goodness sake, woman, say quilt bag or gay or something. Uh, community have a right to see themselves reflected in history that they study. Okay, this is beyond stupid. An eight-year-old has no sexual identity, gay or straight. Or they shouldn't. If they do, then there's something else that's going on, sexual abuse in the home or something. But an eight-year-old shouldn't even have a sexual identity. An eight-year-old shouldn't want to do stuff like that with anybody of any sex. So the idea that, well, they, they have a right to see themselves reflected in history. Uh, first of all, no, you don't. Like, we're all members of the human race. This is one of the dumbest things that I've heard. This has been, been cropping up around different, uh, different studies. You remember we did a study, or we did a story not too long ago that they were talking about minorities in mathematics, and they're like, well, they should see themselves reflected in mathematicians. Look. It's a mathematician. You can like a mathematician no matter the color of their skin or whether they were gay or straight or anything like that. I just mentioned a mathematician that was gay. And I think the guy's a hero because he helped defeat the Nazis. Disagree with his lifestyle, think that he lived an immoral life. That doesn't mean I don't admire his contributions to society and defeating a great evil. I can understand that. But... What's so ridiculous here is they're saying that, well, you should see yourself reflected. I can see myself reflected in historic figures regardless of whether I share all of their beliefs or their skin color or anything like that. They've tried to constantly make history as relatable as possible, which is dumb. Kids will figure that out on their own. And it's perfectly okay to point out, hey, this historical figure was like you in certain ways. That's okay. But the idea that you can't learn from something, that you can't learn from a figure that, you know, has some similarities to you because of the color of their skin or their sexual orientation is stupid. I mean, when it comes to that, let's say that I was looking through, uh, I, I tell you what, I'll use this example. One of my biggest figures in history that, that I admire is George Washington Carver. I have an amazing amount of respect for him. Why? Because I care about agriculture. 
My father was an ag teacher. I was an ag teacher for a brief time. I come from a long line of farmers. That man was a hero to me. Not because I saw myself reflected in him because he was a, a black man and so am I, because I'm obviously not. I saw myself reflected in him because I know his backstory and I know his struggle. I don't have to share a skin color or a sexual orientation with somebody to relate to them. That's all that intersectionality bullcrap that the left has been pushing. The idea that you would have to, for a gay kid, for that kid to be able to relate to history, he would need to think of some gay people in history. No, that's absurd. And of course, you know how I feel about homosexuality, but the point is, you you don't have to spoon feed them somebody that's exactly like them to relate to somebody like that in history. I mean, for goodness sake, probably the literary character that I relate to the most in all of human history, in all of literature, would probably be the Apostle Peter. I share almost nothing in common with him on a logistical, on paper sort of, of, of way. I'm not Jewish. I'm not living 2,000 years in the past. I, I don't have any of this. I, I'm not a fisherman. I, I don't have any of the stuff in common with Peter other than the the way that he saw things, the way that he constantly messed up and had to come back from that. Like, I relate to the things that he did, not the person that he was on paper. And that's really how we should be studying history anyway. And another thing that I find funny about this statement, do you notice the contradiction? Did you spot it? Because what they are saying here is, if it's really about seeing yourself reflected in history, then how does it positively affect, to use their words, non-LGBTQ students? That doesn't make any sense. You're saying, well, they need to see themselves reflected in history. And by the way, studies have shown that including gay people, in, uh, including the sexuality of the people in this uh, curriculum, actually improves the experience of gay and non-gay students. Well, that doesn't make any sense. If it's all about seeing themselves reflected in history, well, then including gay people, that wouldn't affect a non-gay person at all. That's what's so stupid about this, is they constantly talk out of both sides of their mouths and don't even realize their own contradictions. Now, I know you're here because you're interested in information on what's going on in the state of Alabama and around the world, and you've come to the right place for that. But it's YouTube, so you could also just be here because you're bored. If you want me to keep making videos to keep you occupied, you need to go ahead and like and subscribe. Otherwise, you're going to have to go back to playing Minesweeper.